President Obama welcomed Uruguayan President Jose Mujica to the White House today. Now, the U.S. presidential dwellings look a bit different than the Uruguayans because Mujica has foregone all the trappings of power and he lives here in his own tiny home on a dirt road in the capital, Montevideo. Mujica's austere lifestyle has grabbed the world's attention since he became president in 2010. He drives a 1987 Volkswagen Beetle, he donates 90% of his salary, and he sells flowers that he grows with his wife, who is, by the way, a senator. But it's Mujica's remarkable transformation from Marxist guerrilla to president and his country's liberal laws, especially on marijuana, that have thrust him into the spotlight now. Uruguay is the first country to fully legalize the marijuana trade, earning it both praise and criticism from all over the world. Ironically, Mujica is also battling big tobacco and he wants Obama's help, he told me, just before their meeting. He's bringing his own goodwill too, reiterating his offer to accept some of the Guantanamo prisoners to help close what he calls that abominable place. President Mujica, welcome to the program and thank you for joining me. It's my pleasure and uh, hello to you. Let me first start by asking you about legalizing marijuana in Uruguay. What is the reaction to the legalization of marijuana in, in your country? It's not legalization. We are regularizing a clandestine market that we want to legalize, that the market the state is going to take charge. We are not expanding addiction. We are trying to resolve the problem in time for people who go into this addiction, which, like any other addiction, is a bad thing. In my country, there is a majority of people who do not understand my policy yet. However, the popularity of it has been climbing up. More people are now understanding what it's all about. It is a measure against traffic, uh, 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 drug dealing. We are trying to snatch the market away from them. Because it's 80 years now that we are repressing drug use. And in 84, we had about 2,000 registered consumers. Today, we have 150,000. So like everywhere in the world, repression by itself doesn't do the job. We are trying to find another way. Uh, this is gaining traction even in the United States. But what do you say to critics who are worried that it'll encourage young people, for instance, to start earlier and therefore become addicted? We think we're going to get the exact opposite effect. Now, when you surround that with this forbidden aura, you are actually calling the young girl to take it up. However, if you place it as a control product that you can purchase at the chemist, like some other drugs like morphine, which is used for certain prescriptions, then we are taking the mystery out of marijuana and we hit the uh, drug dealers. You were the leader of the Tupamaru guerrillas in uh, Uruguay for many years. And at that time, there was a deep anti-Americanism, obviously, amongst the rebels. You are president of Uruguay. How you feel about the evolution that here you are now going to the White House. I want to know how you feel. I cannot deny reality. I don't know whether I like this planet or not, but I have to accept it. It would be uh, disingenuous for me if thinking that if a small country like mine ignores what the United States is today. There is not just one United States. There are a lot of things in the States that I could consider to be reactionary of invasive attitudes. Things that sometimes are even scary because of the amount of power this country has in response to Latin America. However, there's also a big debate in the States. There's a human progress. There's a technological and scientific 
development that helps the whole of humanity. So we cannot just put everything in one bag and just say one word to describe the U.S. The States is a, an amazing place. The president might be a bit restricted by Congress, but a lot of us, and I will say it like this, we never thought uh, that a black person would actually get to power in the United States, so that's a battle won. Mr. President, you have captured the world's imagination because you are known as the world's poorest president. In fact, you choose to live in your original residence of your own. You won't go and live inside the presidential palace. Can you tell me what it is that motivates you and how your 14 years in jail affects the way you live today? My years in jail were a bit like a workshop for my that actually forged my way of thinking and my values. I'm not a poor president. Uh, poor are the people who need a lot. And that was Seneca said that. I am an austere president. I do not need much to live. I live in the same way I used to live when I wasn't a president. I live in the same neighborhood, in my same house, and in the same way. And I am a Republican. I live like the majority in my country lives. It was a majority who voted for me, and that's why I identify with them. Morally, I do not have the right to live like a minority in my country. A lot of people like a lot of money. They shouldn't go into politics. That's my way of seeing it. I am not improvising. I'm not, I don't do marketing. This is my philosophy. How long did you spend in solitary confinement and how did you manage to survive that? Because human beings are strong and that's what I want to transmit to people, that we can trip and fall but we can always stand up and start anew. We shouldn't look for that strength outside, we have it inside ourselves. We shouldn't blame others, we have to look inside ourselves for that strength. Nature has given us all we need. The ones who fail are those who stop fighting. Life is a lovely fight. We have to defend it. And that's something I came to ask President Obama. We have a fight against tobacco. Eight million people die a year by smoking. That's a lot more than all the people who die at wars. Philip Morris is suing Uruguay because of your actions against uh, smoking and against tobacco. What is your response to that? I have said it already. I, it's not about companies, it's not about suing. I, I'm just asking that we do have to really fight against this. Life is worth everything and we have to fight for it. Being alive is a miracle and I will really insist every day. That's why this battle against tobacco and other battles for life, I will always fight for them. I just want to ask you finally to explain how you survived, what you did to get through 10 years in solitary confinement. I read that you, you, you interacted with the insects and befriended the rats in your cage. Why was that important? If you catch a black ant, a normal, common ant, you grab it with two fingers, you put her right inside your ear, and you'll hear it scream. But of course, you need time to do that, and you have to be really lonely. When you spend a long time by yourself in a solitary confinement, a frog, a rat that comes to eat because you leave some crumbs there, it's life. It's the life you have there. And probably there's nothing worse than loneliness after death. We are gregarious. We need society to live. We never save ourselves 
alone. We always save ourselves with the others. These are all very elemental things of life, yet they are things that we forget too often. Mr. President, Jose Pepe Mujica, you've had an incredible journey and you have an incredible story. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much.